We're just waiting for a few more people to join now and then we'll be on our way. Great. So for those of you who don't know me, I'm Rachel De Bono, a Chartered Financial Planner at Tilney. And I'm delighted to welcome you on behalf of Tilney and Blake Morgan to our webinar on a smarter way to pass on your wealth and plan for the future. Before we start, I've been asked to share this slide that just explains that the webinar today is for information only and not advice. Of course, if you'd like advice after the webinar, please just get in touch. Our contact details will be shown later in the presentation. As you'll see from the next slide, we have a busy hour ahead. And if I may, I'll start with some housekeeping. The webinar is being recorded and that's really for our training purposes and also to pass on to those who wanted to attend today but couldn't. You'll also notice that all of your cameras have been turned off and so is your sound. The only people you'll be able to see and hear today are the presenters. We're going to have a Q&A session at the end and we'll control that by the Q&A button that you should be able to see at the bottom of the screen. If you type your question in there, then I'll ask the questions on your behalf. And of course, if we run out of time, then I'll make sure we follow up personally after the webinar. You'll be pleased to hear that it's not just my voice that you're listening to today. And I'm very fortunate to be joined by Head of Private Clients, Lisa Davis of Blake Morgan, and her team, Nikki Sherrard and Ben Coulson. I'm also very privileged to be joined by my colleague, Ian Dahl, Head of Estate Planning at Tilney. But before I pass you into their safe hands, I just wanted to give you a brief overview of Tilney. So for those of you who are new to Tilney, then we are one of the largest and leading financial planning and investment management companies in the UK. We've been around for over 180 years and we are entrusted by over 100,000 clients to look after 24 billion of their money. So we're a big company and I think that's important right now. We're financially secure and our clients need to have peace of mind that we have the investment expertise and the financial strength to navigate them through the current economic crisis. But despite our size, we haven't lost a personal contact. And for those of you who are my clients listening today, I'm sure we'll vouch for the fact that we have regular meetings with our clients. Of course, some clients do just come to us for one off piece of advice, but others will become our clients for life. And we have such close relationships with our clients that we often get to know their family members who in turn become our clients too. We also work very closely with our clients' accountants and solicitors. And on that note, I'll pass you over to Lisa Davis of Blake Morgan. Hello, um, thank you, Rachel. And thank you to everyone who's taken the time to uh, join us and participate today. Um, some of those people are in fact Blake Morgan clients already, and uh, we're delighted to welcome you back. But others are here for Tilney and perhaps haven't had the opportunity to learn anything about Blake Morgan before now. So it's my pleasure to tell you a little bit about us. So on the next slide, you'll see that we are a full service law firm. Effectively, what that means is that we offer a wide range of legal services to a wide range of people. So we act for individuals, but also for organisations. Some of those are large, some of those are small, some of them are public and some of them are private. And you can see here on this slide that we not only have a wide range, we have an extraordinary range of 70 legal disciplines. So when you drill down and look at the kind of advice we give, it really can cover a, a huge variety of subjects. Um, and we're almost certainly going to be able to help you if you approach us. We also have 900 plus staff working from five offices, well, working from home near five offices across the country. And we've had accreditations from a wide range of uh, organizations you can see on the slide who recognize us as a leading law firm. On the next slide, you'll see that we're also specialists in particular areas, including succession and tax, which is the department that I represent and that we're going to talk to you um, about today. We offer a whole range of private client services. So that can be things like will drafting, but also the estate planning and tax mitigation work that you'll be hearing about from Ian um, later on. And in fact, it's in that kind of capacity that we work very closely with um, accountants, IFAs such as Tilney and have done for many, many years. If you um, consider we also do probate work, but not just your run of the mill work, we offer the um, more complex estate planning and also the complex estate admin. 
So dealing with agricultural and business assets, literary estates, complex intestacies, overseas assets and the like. We draft trusts and we can also help you in, if we go back to the last slide, you'll see that we draft trusts and we can also help you as professional trustees and we advise lay trustees equally so that they can help fulfill their role properly. We deal with certain elements of elder client work and have a team specialising from our Southampton office in court of protection. But we also, throughout the, the firm, in the various locations, advise on powers of attorney of different types, um, including lasting powers of attorney, which is what we will be talking to you about later on today. So now for the final slide, you'll see that behind all of these um, areas of, of work and the breakdown into different areas and, and, and offices, we're individuals. We're quality lawyers who are, offer a quality service. We offer a local personal service, and that's really the most important thing that I think I want you to take away about Blake Morgan today. So why would you choose us and what do we stand for? Well, first and foremost, long-standing, long-term, lasting relationships. And that's both with our referrers and our clients and our colleagues. Uh, indeed, Nikki, who you'll be hearing from later, uh, Nikki and I first started working together some 15 years ago. And in fact, Rachel, who you've just heard from, and I have been working together for almost as long as that, referring clients for our mutual benefit. I would like to say that not only do these people come back because they know us, they come back because they know and trust us. And being a trusted advisor who offers quality work and value for money is the most important thing that I think we can, uh, we can bring to you. We're honest and we're transparent. You will know who you are dealing with. You will know what we're going to do for you. You'll know when we're going to try and get it done by and how long and how much it's going to take and cost and the kind of, you know, the, the roadmap as to how we're going to achieve it. When you call us, you'll be calling your lawyer. You'll get a direct line to the person that you're used to working with and who is responsible for your work. It's not a call center. It's not a switchboard. You don't have to go through layers of bureaucracy to speak to the person that you've been developing a relationship with. And it's for that reason that I hope that you will either continue to be a client of Blake Morgan or give us a try with the sort of work that we're going to be discussing with you today. And in fact, it is with pleasure now that I'm able to hand you over to Ian Dial, who will continue the discussion with some talk about how you can, in fact, pass on your wealth in a smarter way. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so when it comes to passing on your, your wealth to the people that matter to you, there are a whole um, suite, there's a whole suite of solutions that uh, could potentially uh, be of use. And therefore, it's really important to have a systematic approach where you can examine all the different solutions that are available um, and decide which are the most appropriate and what order of implementing them is going to be the best uh, to meet your own personal circumstances. So what I want to talk about today is the approach that we use within Tilney, um, uh, which is a four, high level four step approach um, that enables you to analyze all of the potential solutions that might be appropriate um, and choose which ones are most suitable. Now, the, the presentation I'm going to go through is normally presented face to face and lasts about 90 minutes. I've got about 20 minutes a day, so it's certainly going to be a high level um, overview of, of, of the approach. If you do want more details, then please feel free to contact uh, Rachel um, and her details will be uh, on a slide towards the end of the presentation. Um, so let's have a look at what we're going to talk about. So when it comes to passing on your assets, people have uh, many different objectives. But for, for many people, at least one of those objectives is to try and mitigate inheritance tax to maximise the amount that's passed on to um, their, their uh, beneficiaries. So we're going to start with a crash course on inheritance tax. What is it? How does it work? To give you an idea of um, uh, at least at a high level how some of the solutions work further on during the presentation. Uh, then we're going to look at a high level four step approach to putting together solutions and we'll look at a few examples in each of those areas and then we'll pick up on some of the key points um, before I hand over uh, to Nikki from, uh, from, from Blake Morgan just to uh, uh, talk about lasting powers of attorney. So what is inheritance tax? Uh, my definition would be it's a tax on transfer of assets during life or on death. So anytime you pass on assets to somebody else, either because you've made a gift during life or you've died and they're inheriting them, you need to think about what's the inheritance tax implication. When will the tax be payable? Generally, it's only payable on death. However, if you put more, too much money into the wrong trust at the wrong time, then you can end up with a 20% liability on the money that goes into the trust. So a big part of planning we do is to understand what sort of planning you need to do going forward to avoid those unnecessary liabilities. 
what assets are taxable in a world everything worldwide so if you're uk domiciled you've got a liability on worldwide assets so property abroad investments abroad that's all part of your estate when it comes to paying inheritance tax the only exception to everything worldwide is working farms and trading companies may qualify for agricultural relief or business relief but the key words there are working and trading a working farm is not i live in a farmhouse i've got five chickens in the backyard something run as a commercial enterprise how much tax do you pay typically you'll pay 40 percent tax on anything above the nil rate band so let's look at that in a bit more depth so each individual has got um, a nil rate band of £325,000. So as a couple, we would each have £325,000 nil rate band. So if at the point of my death as an individual, my assets are worth £325,000 or less, um, then I, there'll be no tax because they'll be taxed at 0%. If I've got an estate of £500,000, the first £325,000 will be taxable at 0%, so no tax remainder taxable at 40% and therefore I'd have a 70,000 pound tax bill. As a couple, if we were worth a million pounds, then because we've got two nil rate bands, 650,000 pounds will ultimately be exempt, the remaining 350,000 taxable at 40% and we'd have 140,000 pounds liability. So if you look at your own personal situation, add up everything you own worldwide, knock off one or two nil rate bands, depending on whether there's one or two of you, multiply the rest by 40%, and that's a rough estimate of what you owe in tax. Now, the reason I say rough estimate is because if you've made gifts in the last seven years, you may have temporarily used part of that nil rate ban for the balance of the seven years. And if you've been widowed in the past as an individual, you may have more than one nil rate ban, and that's a concept to, uh, to do with transfer, uh, the transfer of nil rate bans. We'll look at that in a few seconds. Now, some of you may be saying, haven't I got a nil rate band in addition to that against my property? And that's true. At the moment, you've got an additional £175,000 per person, but many people won't be able to benefit from it because there are some fairly stringent rules that you need to meet in order to benefit. So first of all, it can only be used against your home. So a rental property, for example, wouldn't qualify. It can only be used if you leave that home to your children or remote issue, issue so grandchildren, etc. Uh, definition of children is quite broad. It includes stepchildren and adopted children, but it wouldn't include, for example, nephews and nieces. Um, it can be transferred to your spouse if it's unused. And it's also means tested in the sense that if your estate is worth more than £2 million at the time of your death, you lose £1 of allowance for every £2 you're over that limit. So um, it, quickly, it quickly gets eroded above that two million pound limit. Now there are some gifts that you can make that are immediately outside of your estate. So you don't need to live for seven years. So these are what the inheritance tax exemptions. If you look at the size of them though, they're fairly small in the majority of cases. So you know, 3000 pound in total per donor per year. Yeah, it's relatively small. So I'm not gonna cover these in any depth, but the one I will cover, there's a couple of useful ones. Normal, income, normal expenditure from income. Um, if you've got more income than you need, then the tax man will allow you to give that, that extra income away on a regular basis, rather than allow it to build up in your estate and, and uh, cause you a higher liability. Now, in order to benefit from that, it needs to meet three rules. First of all, it has to be out of income. So for example, if you've got a hundred thousand pound in a bank or building society, you can give away the interest, that's the income, but you can't give away the hundred thousand pound of capital. Secondly, it has to be regular in nature, so it can't be a one-off gift, it has to be annually or more frequently. And thirdly, it can't affect your standard of living, so you can't deprive yourself in order to make the gift. But as long as it meets those three rules, it would be exempt. Gifts to charity, either during life or on death, are exempt. And if you give more than 10% of your net estate to charity, then you'll only pay 36% inheritance tax on the remainder. So that can be quite a useful way of passing money to charity. And possibly the most useful one, gifts to spouse. So any gifts to husband or wife or civil partners um, during life or on death are exempt. So those are the exemptions, but if you gift more than those exemptions or outside of those exemptions, then typically you'll need to live for seven years in order for that, that gift to be effective. Um, and 
also the you can't have any access to that gift it's, that would cause what's called the reservation of benefit so you can't continue to use the asset you've given away or have strings attached saying you can have it back if you want it back i briefly mentioned a transferable nil rate band so let's just briefly talk about that um, prior to october 2007 if i was married and i left everything to my wife then there would be no tax on my death because there's an exemption between husband and wife. But on my wife's death, um, she would only have one nil rate band to use. And therefore, even if let's say, for example, we had a 600,000 pound estate and the nil rate band was 300,000 pounds. So theoretically we should be able to pass it down without tax. I would have wasted my nil rate band by um, not uh, passing anything to people other than my spouse. Um, now, in 2007, Gordon Brown, who was Chancellor at the time, introduced this concept of a transferable nil rate band, which meant that if I did that today, I pass all my assets to my wife. Um, she would obviously have all the assets, but she'd also inherit my unused nil rate band. Um, and that goes back even before this was introduced. So even if I was widowed, let's say, in the 1990s, provided I can show that my spouse didn't use her nil rate band, then yeah, I could transfer that nil rate band and use it on my death. However, and this is important, you can only have one additional nil rate band. So if you marry multiple times, you can inherit parts of nil rate bands from each spouse, but you can never have more than one additional nil rate band. So that's the crash course on inheritance tax. What I want to start looking at now is um, starting to plan. Um, so let's talk about what we mean by estate planning. So my definition would be it's about passing on your assets to the people that matter to you in the most effective way. And when we say effective, there's lots of factors that you need to consider when you're talking about effective. Part of it is tax efficiency, which we've been talking about, but there are other factors such as how important is it to protect the assets? Do you have a beneficiary who, for example, um, is going through a divorce or is about to become bankrupt, or maybe they're just too young to handle money? You know, so it might be that you need to protect those assets. Do you have a beneficiary who will always be vulnerable? Perhaps they've got a long-term illness that means they need help even beyond your death. And most importantly, what access are you going to need for yourself? It's no point making the next generation wealthy if you leave yourself financially vulnerable in the meantime. So all these competing objectives need to be considered. When it does come to, uh, to mitigating inheritance tax, it's a balancing act. And it's a balancing act between two conflicting objectives. On, on the one side, the access that you're gonna need yourself in order to, um, to, to uh, make sure you don't leave yourself financially vulnerable. But on the other hand, um, the tax saving that might be potentially available. And as a general rule, the more access you've got, the less tax efficiency there is and vice versa. So the question is what solutions and what order of implementing those solutions will get each individual client to that optimal balance between access versus tax saving. Now, there's a bewildering array of solutions available to mitigating inheritance tax, but I would, I would contend that if you distill them all down, there's only really three things you can do about inheritance tax. The first thing you can do is you can make better use of the allowances and the reliefs the tax man gives you. So keeping full access to your money but at the same time, you're managing to make some form of saving. And the big ones there are um, the nil rate band, the residence nil rate band, and perhaps business property relief and agricultural property relief. The next step then is to reduce the size of your estate. And that could be done by gifting or it could be done by spending. And if it is done by gifting, the question is, should it be an outright gift, which is nice and simple, or should it be by using trusts? The final step then, because there'll be a point where you can't gift anymore without leaving yourself vulnerable, is to pay the liability, but pay it in a more efficient manner. And that's often where we'll use life insurance to protect that liability. Now, in many client situations, there's also a fourth step, which is what I call quick wins. They're things that you look at in a client situation and you say, well, why wouldn't you do that? It's an obvious first step. Generally, there'll be things which um, provide a tax benefit, but don't necessarily provide any loss of access. So I'm gonna use these four steps as the agenda for the remainder of my session. And let's look at some of the examples in each of those areas in turn. So let's start with the quick wins. So a, a typical quick win might be, for example, if you've got a protection policy that you took out perhaps, so life assurance, so you took out so that if you died, your spouse had got enough money to live on. 
If that's not written in trust, it will pay out into your estate. So potentially, for example, if you've got £100,000 sum assured, you might lose £40,000 of that to the tax man. We can retrospectively put that into a trust, which will immediately take the sum assured outside of your estate. And although you've effectively given it away, so you, have, you personally haven't got the access to that policy, um, it would never have a value until after your death anyway. So actually the loss of access doesn't, doesn't make any real difference. So that's a typical quick win. If you've got pensions, then there's a real question these days as to what your pension is for. It used to be the case that if you got a pension fund um, that was still in existence on your death, that you paid 55% tax on that. And because 55% is higher than the inheritance tax rate, it generally meant that it, there was no point preserving your pensions. You were better off spending your pensions and, uh, and gifting other assets. But now, since 2014, you can give away a pension fund to a nominated beneficiary and they won't pay inheritance tax on it. The only tax they'll pay on it is income tax as they draw down on it at their own income tax rate. So for many people, particularly high rate taxpayers, that makes more sense now to fund their retirement using other assets and use their pension as an estate planning vehicle. Um, gifting using, if you've re recently received um, a, an inheritance, and when I say recently, I mean within the last two years, and you don't feel you need that money, another option might be to use what's called a deed of variation. If you accepted the inheritance and gave it away, you'd need to live for seven years and you couldn't have any access to that money. Um, whereas if you do a deed of variation, either outright to the, the uh, uh, to other beneficiaries or to a trust, then that works immediately. It takes it out of the original beneficiary's estate. Um, if you do need access to it in some way, or think you might need access in certain circumstances, you could vary to a trust which you are a beneficiary of. And because it's seen as the deceased person who is making the gift, that's still effective for inheritance tax. It doesn't put the asset into your estate, um, yet you've still got access and it works immediately. So that's for people who've inherited, probably from people other than their spouse in the last two years. And the other thing you need to consider is if you lose capacity to make decisions for yourself, so you haven't died now, you're, you've just lost capacity, um, should you have a, a lasting power of attorney in place? And Blake Morgan are going to talk a little bit more about that in a second. So I'm going to leave that, that bit there. The next step then is to make best use of the allowances and reliefs. And probably um, the, 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 the bulk of the planning in this area is to do with will planning. So that's why we work with people like Blake Morgan. Our approach is to identify all the solutions that you should be looking at, including those that we don't actually implement ourselves because we want to make sure that you take advantage of all the different opportunities. Now, I talked about in the past, um, if, you know, pre-2007, before there was the transferable nil rate band, people used to waste the nil rate band by leaving everything to the spouse on first death. Um, and this, our solution to that typically was a thing called a discretionary will trust, where rather than leave everything to the spouse, we would leave an amount up to the nil rate band into a discretionary trust, which the spouse could still benefit from. So they've still got access, but it means that on first death, the nil rate band would be used. The question is, are they still worthwhile today? Well, I'd say yes, for a number of reasons. There are some people, for example, who may have been widowed in the past and have remarried. And if that's the case, they may have more than two nil rate bands as a couple. They may have inherited a nil rate band from the, the late spouse of one of the partners. Now, remember, you can only pass on one additional nil rate band. So it would still be important to pass on uh, to use a nil rate band or maybe even two nil rate bands on first death. So leaving money into a trust that the spouse can benefit from helps with that. But there are other benefits as well. The money in that, that trust doesn't form part of the surviving spouse's estate. So if they needed to go into care, it wouldn't form part of the means testing. If they remarried, we can make sure that that money goes to the original children of the first marriage, not the second marriage. Um, and even it may help to keep the surviving spouse's estate less than £2 million for the purposes of the residence nil rate band. So there's a lot of uh, reasons why it may be worth considering a discretionary will trust in people's wills. So as I say, make best use of the allowances and releases is, is that step. The next step is to reduce the size of the estate. And that can be done by gifting or it could be done by spending. And the question is, 
um, you know, what is the best way to approach that? So typically before we start recommending people spend more money or, or and many people do hold back unnecessarily in retirement because psychologically they've saved, saved all their life. It's difficult to switch gear and start spending money and seeing your net wealth go down. So, you know, often spending money is, is, is a, a good solution if you're holding back unnecessarily. The way we judge that is we use cash flow forecasting to look at what money you're likely to need based on all your sort of ambitions and goals going forward um, to identify what money will be spare and what money can be gifted away. And we'll stress test that with different scenarios. Like if, for example, somebody needed long-term care or if the, the, the larger pension earner dies first, et cetera. So once we've uh, worked out how much you can afford to give away, um, then the question is, should it be outright gifts or should it be one of the many different types of trusts that we have available, all of which have different types of uh, features and benefits? Um, and the answer in most client situations is it's often a combination of both, you know, some outright gifting, some gifts to trust, etc. Um, so we look at the individual circumstances, whether protection of a trust is, is necessary. Um, and use that to steer us as to what's the best way to give money away is. Now, there come a, a point where you can't gift away any more money without leaving yourself financially vulnerable. So the last step is to pay the remaining liability, but pay it in a more efficient way. This is where we use life cover to, to fund that remaining liability. And typically, um, that can be, uh, the way we use it is in one of two ways. If you've still got a liability that's always going to be there, perhaps because it's the value of your property, um, then what we would do is cover that with a whole of life plan, joint life, second death. Um, so what that means is it doesn't pay out on first death, it pays out on the second death because that's when the liability hits. And typically we will um, put that into trust so that that gets around another issue on death, which is a bit of a cash flow issue that inheritance tax has to be paid before probate is granted and probate needs to be granted before the assets are released, which might be the assets that you need to pay the inheritance tax bill. By having assets in trust, whether that's a life policy or just investments, that money can be accessed prior to probate um, in order to pay that liability. The other way we'll use life cover is if you make gifts in excess of the nil rate band, then the first impact is it will eliminate your nil rate band for seven years, but anything in excess of that will create a liability for the recipient and that's a problem because if they spend that money and then you die within seven years, they may need to suddenly find that find money to pay the tax. So by insuring the donor um, we could, for that seven year period with a term policy, we can uh, free up the ability to spend that money. So key points to remember, plan early, um, define your goals. Who, who do you want to benefit? When do you want them to benefit, et cetera? Look at the whole picture. So, you know, if you've got uh, pension policies, are they going to be for your funding your retirement or should they be an estate planning vehicle? If you've got a business, what's your exit strategy for your business, etc. Systematically review all the options. And, and as I say, we will look at all the options, including those where we need to work with other professionals in order to implement them. Be sensible. It doesn't really make sense to give all your money to your children and hope that they can give it back if they if they if you need it, because what happens if they get divorced? What happens if they become bankrupt? That money might not be there. There are some investments in this area you need to be careful of. So AIM portfolios, for example, can be really useful for certain for the right people, but you are investing in smaller companies. So you need to think about the volatility of the investments as well. Um, review regularly. Your family situation will change. And finally, take advice. Um, you know, we see seminars like these is a relaxed environment where you can see who we are and what we do uh, and make a decision if you want to work with us if we do our, our details will be at the end um, but make it's, it's not an area where um, people who are not familiar with this area should be dabbling in it's an area where you need to fully understand all the implications of your actions so it's important to find a good advisor that's all from me. So I'd like to hand over now to Nikki Sherrard um, from Blake Morgan, who's going to talk a little bit about lasting powers of attorney. So, uh, Nikki. Hello. Thanks, Ian. That was really interesting and a lot of ground covered there. Um, as already mentioned, I'm Nikki Sherrard and I'm a solicitor in the team at our Cardiff office. Um, Lisa let you know in her introduction that we work closely with Tilney and other 
um, advises and refers to help our clients achieve their goals. Um, by collaborating today, we're hoping to show you how your financial advisor and solicitor can work together to help you plan for the future. So my colleague Ben and I, when considering what we would talk about today, um, and having seen the content of Ian's presentation, we thought about how best we could complement that and put a different perspective on the work that we do. So Ian's given us an insight into how we can um, pass on wealth. And we thought a beneficial topic to look at today with you was how you could consider putting lasting powers of attorney in place. And you may recall during um, Ian's presentation that he mentioned this, and it really does help you plan for the future. So we want to show you what you can do to ensure if there comes a time when you decide either that you want some support in dealing with your, your financial affairs and property, or if you become ill or have an accident and were unable to deal with your own affairs and make your own decisions, how this type of document, the lasting power of attorney, can help you and your loved ones at a difficult time. So don't switch off, please. Even if you already have lasting powers of attorney or even an enduring power of attorney in place, as you may learn something you didn't already know. So a little bit of background. Lasting powers of attorney were introduced by the Mental Capacity Act 2005, and they came into being, came into being on the 1st of October 2007. So the Office of the Public Guardian oversees the creation and registration of these documents, and the Court of Protection polices those documents and the actions taken by your attorneys and deputies. And I'll talk a bit more about that terminology as we make our way through. So I always explain to clients an LPA is a bit like an insurance policy. And I know Ben's probably going to repeat this when he talks to you, but it's really worth thinking about because it's a great way to help you appreciate their importance and the benefit of taking the time to put them in place now. So we've all got house insurance and it covers us if the building burns down. Obviously, we hope that doesn't happen. So it's a bit similar. So with an LPA, you do the work now, you put the documents in place, you register them with the um, public guard, with the office of the public guardian, and then you store them somewhere safe and hope they never see the light of day. But if you decide later in life that you need some help with your financial decisions, or indeed you lose capacity to make those decisions, your lasting power of attorney ensures that your family and or appointed attorneys have the ability and legal authority to step in and make those decisions for you. And so an LPA will give both you and your family peace of mind. Um, so on this slide now that you can see, what is an LPA? So an LPA is a legal document and it applies in the UK. It enables a person who is 18 or over to appoint a person or persons who are also 18 or over and of your choosing to make decisions on your behalf. OK, so that's with your authority or when you're unable to make those decisions yourself. So the key word here, lasting, determines that the authority may continue even if you, the person who's made the document, the donor, no longer has the capacity to deal with their own affairs. On this slide, you can see that we've listed there are two types of lasting powers of attorney. And I've been working as a solicitor in this area of law for just over 20 years. And until 2007, I would have been advising you to consider making an enduring power of attorney. And indeed, some of you may already have that in place. These documents are still valid and provide for your appointed attorneys to make decisions for you in relation to your property and financial affairs. So if you have an enduring power of attorney, please let us know and we can have a chat because it might be a better solution for you to have a lasting power of attorney in place. So property and finance decisions allows your appointed trusted family, friends or advisors of your choosing to make decisions for you. And as I've already said, as it's lasting, this, is, this appointment is given importantly with your consent or authority and also without. So once it's registered with the Office of the Public Guardian, if you lose capacity, the document is still valid for your attorneys to make those decisions for you. So an example of the importance of having this document in place is if you hold, for example, a joint bank account, and this absolutely applies if you have assets in your sole name, if you um, lose capacity to deal with your affairs 
and there isn't this type of authority in place for somebody to step in and make those decisions. Even with a joint bank account, the bank may decide to restrict the use of those funds. And it does take a while to get provision in place if you haven't got something like this. So um, it really cements the importance of having these documents in place. Now on the slide, we've also listed that you can make an LPA for health and welfare. And as I mentioned in the introduction, from October 2007, when the LPA was created or born, in addition to the new LPA for property and financial decisions, which replaced the old enduring power of attorney, the, the Act, the Mental Capacity Act, created a new document for health and welfare decisions. And this is something that the enduring power of attorney doesn't cover. So this LPA allows your attorneys, your appointed attorneys, to be involved with making sure your needs are met. So helping, for example, decide where you should live and also the care that you may need or receive. An important difference for the health and welfare LPA is that it can only be used once it's deemed that the person who made the document, so the donor, is unable to make that decision themselves. And so to assist attorneys appointed under this type of LPA with those decisions and whether they should make the decision, the Act provides guidance with five principles of how you would interpret the term capacity. So with health and welfare decisions, the person who's made the document document may still be able to make some everyday decisions, but their attorneys are then legally appointed to assist with more complex decisions when that person is no longer able to make those decisions. And so Ben's going to cover that in a bit more detail. So next slide, please. So what happens if I don't have an LPA and is this a problem? So we just wanted to give you a feel for the situation. If you listen today and think, I, I don't see the benefit in wasting my time putting these in place, but a bit of doom and gloom from us now. So if you don't have any provision in place in relation to your property and finances, everything, you can't touch any of your assets. And during the time that an application is being made to the court of protection for somebody to be able to deal with your affairs, um, nobody's able to deal with your property. The application is made to the court and the person who is given authority to deal with your affairs is not an attorney. They're referred to as your deputy. So there be a court order appointing someone to be your deputy. Um, and the problem with this is a lengthy process. The application is um, complex and costly. OK, the other main difference about this is if you have have to go down that route, then um, the deputy has to report to the Office of the Public Guardian every year with annual accounts. And also there are fees involved for the um, Office of the Public Guardian to be involved to sort of just supervise the decisions made by the deputy. In relation to health and welfare, again, it's an application to the Court of Protection. Again, complex, lengthy, costly. The donor, the person who's lost capacity, if you like, must be represented in this application. And also the deprivation of liberty safeguards, dolls, comes into question and have to review and take this into consideration, the court does. And again, that definition of capacity, what decisions that person is able to make and unable to make. And it's a really very complex process. Um, next slide, please. So how do I make an LPA? So we're going to look at useful terminology and then Ben's going to go th run through making an LPA and the powers that your attorneys appointed under each type of LPA can make. OK, so next slide some useful terminology. So I've already used some of these words, donor, the person making the LPA, donating the power to the people who are going to make those decisions for you. Attorney, they're the people who are going to make those decisions on your behalf. And that will be in accordance with any instructions or preferences that you might have included in your document. Again, Ben's going to look at that. And something I haven't touched on is a certificate provider. So this is a sort of a friend who you've known for two years or a professional person. And often when we make lasting powers of attorney for our clients and advise on them, we are able then to act as the certificate provider. And this is another layer that the Act has added to ensure that the person who's making this really important document understands what they're doing and the authority that they're giving to their attorneys to make decisions on their behalf. And on occasion with 
elderly clients or certain clients, we might refer this task to their GP or other medical advisor just to make sure that they understand what they're entering into. So that's my part of the presentation completed and I'm now happy to hand over to Ben who'll take you through the remainder. Many thanks. Great, thank you, Nikki. So as Nikki has outlined, putting LPAs in place are a good way to plan for the future and can be beneficial for both you and your family. I will be discussing the practicalities of making an LPA and the aspects that you need to consider. So I thought it'd be useful if I use my part of the talk to go through some frequently asked questions, as you will see on the slide. So let's start. So who can make an LPA? Well, this one's very straightforward and is simply anyone over the age of 18 who has the capacity to do so. Who can be an attorney? This should be people you trust implicitly, know well, and can include your spouse, your partner, children, or even a good friend. As Nikki mentioned, they must be at least 18 and must have the capacity to make decisions themselves. For the financial and property LPA, they must not be bankrupt for obvious reasons. If you do not have someone suitable to act for you as your attorney, there is an option to appoint a professional attorney and we at Blake Morgan can help in this instance. So how can your attorneys act? Your attorneys can act in a number of different ways. They are jointly, jointly and severally, and sometimes jointly and sometimes jointly and severally. If appointed jointly, attorneys must agree unanimously on every decision, however big or small. If they can't agree, then they can only make that decision by going to court. So the, the, the option comes with a bit of a health warning um, in that if one of the attorneys dies or can no longer act, all of your attorneys become unable to act and your LPA will actually stop working unless you appoint at least one replacement attorney when making your LPA. Jointly and severally appointed attorneys can make decisions on their own or together. Most people choose this option because it's the most practical. Unlike the previous option, if one of the attorneys dies or can no longer act, your LPA will continue to work. The third option simply does what it says on the tin. If you choose this option, you must list the decisions your attorney should make jointly in the, L in the LPA itself. So can I appoint substitute or replacement attorneys? You need at least one acting attorney, but you can choose replacement attorneys should you so wish. The replacements can step in if one of the original attorneys can no longer act. And this is a good way to future proof your LPAs as if something were to happen to your original attorney or attorneys and you do not have a replacement, the LPA will fail. Okay, so on to the next slides. When can an LPA be used? So the starting point is that an LPA must be registered with the Office of the Public Guardian. Once registered, a health and welfare LPA can only be used when you no longer have the capacity to make your decisions for yourself. The LPA for property and finance is slightly different and more flexible in that it can be used either once you no longer have the capacity to make decisions or as soon as it is registered with the court. You will make this choice when preparing your LPA. So considering these options in turn, only when I lack capacity, there is a slight health warning in choosing this option. So consider that capacity can be a, a bit of a gray area and excuse the pun there. Um, and a medical practitioner may need to be consulted by your attorneys if there is any ambiguity as to your mental capacity. This can be time consuming and costly and may be a burden on your attorneys. So to give you a, a, a real life example, your local bank manager may ask your attorneys to provide evidence of your lack of capacity every time your attorney wants to do something straightforward like pay a bill for you. So you will need to consider this carefully if planning to select this option. As soon as it is registered, this is where the aforementioned flexibility comes in. Your attorneys can use the LPA once registered 
even if you have the capacity to make decisions yourself. However, any decision must be made with your consent and authority. So again, an example how, as to how this may be beneficial for you is if you suffer, suffer a physical injury which impacts your ability to manage your affairs but does not affect your mental capacity. With your consent, your attorneys can help you with your day-to-day -day needs such as visiting the bank, signing documents or withdrawing cash for you. Can I add instructions or preferences? The short answer is yes. However, there are things to consider before doing so. You may limit or impede your attorney by including an instruction or preference now, which may not be suitable or relevant in the future as your circumstances change over time. Additionally, if the court thinks that the instruction or preference is not straightforward, easy to understand or capable of being put into practice, then they can reject the application for registration. So as we've mentioned previously, your appointed attorneys should be those you implicitly trust, and it may be better to talk to your attorneys and explain to them how you'd like them to act, which would then leave them free to make decisions they think are right and which they know will be in accordance with your wishes. That said, there is one beneficial instruction we do advocate, and that's the inclusion of uh, the inclusion of um, the use of a discretionary fund manager, simply because this is a practical clause that will allow your attorneys to instruct or continue to instruct uh, or continue to use even a fund manager like your advisors at Tilney. Not having this clause may affect your discretionary fund manager's ability to continue to manage your investment. So uh, have a look at that. Okay. Moving on to the next slide, I'm just going to explain briefly the, the, the types of powers you can give your attorneys. So on the screen is an indicative rather than exhaustive list, but it gives you a flavour of the types of decisions that an attorney of a property and finance LPA can make on your behalf. It, it's important to understand the scope of the powers you are granting your attorneys as they will be able to do small things such as pay bills, or claim benefits on, on your behalf to much bigger things like sell your house. On the next slide, again, I've included the types of powers you'll be granting your attorneys under an LPA for health and welfare. I want to focus on one particular power, and that is the one found at the bottom right of the diagram, life-sustaining treatments. This particular power requires you to make a mandatory election when preparing your LPF LPA for health and welfare. So you, you either elect to give your attorneys the power to give or refuse consent to life-sustaining treatment on your behalf. Life-sustaining treatment can mean many things, um, you know, usually things like care, surgery, medicine, just simply any help from doctors that's needed to keep you alive. It can very much depend on the situation as well. So for example, if you had pneumonia, a simple course of antibiotics could be life sustaining. The alternative, if you choose not to give the attorney the power, is that these decisions will be made by a healthcare professional instead. Onto, the, onto my last slide. So we've listed here the types of services that we at Blake Morgan can offer in terms of making uh, and storing your LPAs. Most of these have been covered uh, in depth in our talk. Um, and really, I just want to finish by saying we've talked about why you should have an LPA and the real benefits of having one in place. And again, just to repeat something Nick, that Nikki said earlier, and just to use the analogy uh, because I like it, LPA should be considered akin to an insurance policy. You hope you don't have to use it, but it's reassuring that it's there and that it can be used should the worst happen. So really the question you have to consider is not why should I have an LPA, it's why haven't I got an LPA in place? Okay, well, thank you for your time and thank you for listening. Um, our contact details will pop up shortly, so please feel feel free to get in touch 
and I'm going to pass you back to Rachel for questions. Thanks very much, Ben, and to all of our speakers today. Um, so question time now, um, and fantastic to see that we've had a good number of questions coming through. But just a reminder, there is a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. So please ask your questions there and I'll ask the speakers on your behalf. I'm also very conscious that if we were doing this webinar actually in person today as a proper presentation, then lots of people would actually prefer to come and speak to us individually rather than ask questions during the event. So Ian, if I can ask you to go to the next slide, I'll um, make sure you have our contact details. So if you'd rather ask us individually, please feel free to email us. But let's get started with some of the questions. Um, Ian, I think the first question is for you. Do trusts pay tax? And if so, do they pay more than we do personally? Um, the short answer is yes, trusts do pay tax. And, and there's a good reason for that, because if trusts didn't pay tax, everybody would put their assets into trusts to make themselves a beneficiary and that way avoid tax. So, so trusts are liable to usual taxes, income tax, capital gains tax, even to some extent to inheritance tax. Um, however, um, the basic principle of trust taxation is to try to make them broadly tax neutral, i.e. you pay no more or less tax than you would if, if, um, if you were um, paying that personally. Now, as with all legislation, um, there are yeah, there are weaknesses in the legislation, which means if you run a, a trust well, um, then you could potentially save tax, and if it's run badly, you could potentially you know pay a little bit more, more tax. For example, you know the um, the trustee tax rate is forty five percent. However, if that income is then paid out, that's for income tax. Uh, if that income is then paid to a beneficiary, typically the beneficiary can then claim back the tax they wouldn't have paid personally. So, as I say, if you run it badly, you might end up paying the 45%, but if you understand how it works, choose the right investments, then you'll pay no more tax than you would necessarily uh, yourself. Okay, thanks, Ian. Um, another question actually for you as well. Um, we've had someone say, they were widowed before the introduction of the nil rate band. Are they still eligible to claim their late spouse's allowance? Uh, yes, is the short answer for both um, the standard nil rate band and the residence nil rate band. So for the standard nil rate band, as long as it wasn't used when they died, so you'd need evidence of that, then it can be transferred to the surviving spouse. Um, for the residence nil rate band, um, you don't need to prove it wasn't used. As long as the estate at the time of death was worth less than £2 million that's of, the, of that person's estate, the person who died, um, then the nil rate ban should be able to be transferred to the uh, surviving spouse. Okay, thanks Ian. Um, so a couple of questions now for Blake Morgan. Um, if I have a last in power of attorney, do I still need a will? That's a really good question actually, and I'm glad somebody's um, asked that because it is an area that I think people get a little bit confused about. Um, yes, you do is the short answer. I think you need both. And actually, in some ways, you could argue that you need a lasting power of attorney even more than a will, because a will takes effect once you die. And, you know, there's a school of thought that when you're gone, you're gone. And although that affects the people you leave behind, it doesn't affect you personally. However, a lasting power of attorney looks after you personally when you're at your most vulnerable. So it not only helps plan for the future in terms of your finances, but as Nikki was saying, and, and indeed Ben, the lasting power of attorney for health and welfare could be um, your only opportunity to speak through somebody else to your medical team about the kind of end of life care you want. Um, when you're no longer able to make those decisions or articulate those decisions for yourself, your perhaps very long held views um, will be still represented by the people that you trust most. So I think, yes, lasting brows of attorney are absolutely uh, essential. They sit alongside a will, they absolutely don't replace one. Although they are sometimes called living wills, and that's maybe where some of this confusion comes in, actually. Okay, thank you. Um, another question for Blake Morgan, actually. Um, I appreciate I need a lasting power of attorney. I would like my daughter to be my attorney, but she lives in Australia. How does this work? I've got, um, I'll, I'll take this one again if I may, because I've got a couple of estates where half the beneficiaries seem to live in Australia. I don't know what it is <laughs> with Australia at the moment. Um, 
Yes, she can be appointed. Um, it, there's no rule that says they have to live in this country. What I would always advise, though, is that you balance um, whether there is somebody else who you would trust equally to do that job who is more conveniently placed. Um, particularly, I think, uh, where there's a time difference for things like health and welfare, we may need to make um, more timely decisions. But even actually with the property and finance, where you have documents that need to come back and forth, a lot of, um, as, you, as you all know well at Tilney, a lot of the financial um, firms still require wet signatures. So, you know, the actual document to be posted back from wherever. And I think it's more important to get the right person than to have somebody who's in the right place. That's absolutely essential to say, but it can be inconvenient and, and impractical to have attorneys that are overseas, especially if they're at quite a distance. But the short answer is yes, you can appoint her. Um, and, and it's a good idea if she is the best and, and only person that, that could do the job for you. Okay, thank you. Um, in the interest of time, I think this is going to have to be the last question. Um, but again, it's a similar question to what we just had for Blake Morgan. Um, again, I know I need to have a last power of attorney. I would like my children to be my attorneys, but they're in their 20s. Is that sensible? Again, the same answer in effect. The most important, and I think actually this is, is worth repeating anyway, the most important decision about making a power of attorney, other than resolving to make one, is choosing the right attorneys. You're giving such wide powers to people, and in particular, where they're going to be taking those decisions when you no longer have the power of censure. You may not be able to tell them what you want them to do. You, you'll have said in your lifetime, you know, whilst you have still had capacity, I beg your pardon, what it is that, that you would like them to do, but they will have free reign once you've lost capacity. So the most important thing is to choose somebody that you absolutely trust. Now, some 20 year olds are extremely sensible um, and would be absolutely the right choice. As long as they're over 18, they can be appointed. What you can't do is say, I would like my children to be my attorneys, but they're not yet of age. Can I make the power of attorney now, put them in? And then if they turn 18 before the power needs to be used, they can act. And, and the answer to that is, I'm afraid, no, you can't. So you can only actually appoint somebody who's already of age. Um, and in those circumstances, we'd recommend that you perhaps make a power of attorney possibly don't go to the expense and, and trouble of registering it yet as it's a sort of interim document and then you'd remake a new one to appoint your children when they reach the right age but certainly if your children are the people you trust most doesn't matter necessarily that they're that little bit younger as long as they're over 18. Okay thank you well a big thank you to all of our speakers today but actually a biggest thank you to all of you listening today for taking the time out of your day to support us um, please do get in touch. We can help you plan for your future better. And of course, I know some of you already will be organised and have taken many of the steps and actions that we've discussed today. But perhaps what we've discussed might be relevant for some of your friends or family members. So please provide our contact details to them. So thank you again. And we hope to speak to you all again soon. Thanks very much.